Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Can everyone hear me? Um, joining us this morning for this briefing on prisoner reentry and the Second Chance Act. My name is Jessica Nickel, and I handle government affairs for the Council of State Governments Justice Center. For those of you who are not familiar with CSG, we represent all three branches of state government, all 50 states, um, and we're very uh, excited to highlight one of our key priority areas, which is prisoner reentry, along with one of our key partners in, uh, in this work, which is NACO. And we have the new executive director for NACO here with us as well. Um, they've co-sponsored this event, Matt Chase, and I don't know if you want to... We, we didn't have room up here because we have so many all-stars in, in reentry. Um, I want to make sure we, we leave some time for um, Matt to talk a little bit about NACO's work and priority around reentry as well. Um, but we have a, a full agenda and lots of folks uh, for you to hear from. Um, but I first wanted to thank uh, Congressman Davis and Senator Portman for uh, co-hosting this event today. Um, they are the um, longtime champions of the Second Chance Act and uh, worked together when Senator Portman was in the House as a congressman with Mr. Davis on a bipartisan approach to addressing prisoner reentry that goes back about 10 years, I think. And also a, a big special thank you to Helen Mitchell. You need to wave and say hello to everyone um, who handles this issue for Congressman Davis and has been amazing to work with and, uh, and a real expert in this area as well. And then Megan Harrington, um, who is handling these issues for Senator Portman. Um, so thank you, a big thank you. I know there's a lot of other offices here who've done amazing work on, on Second Chance too, so, so thank you for um, uh, for being here and for your continued support. Um, just very quickly, we have, um, I kind of think the best and brightest and a lot of the folks that helped us along the way uh, develop uh, the Second Chance Act, uh, identifying um, what works, what doesn't, what where the gaps are, and how we can advance the field around reentry. Uh, so first, we have Denise O'Donnell, who's the director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance um, that administers the Second Chance Act um, and many of the public safety and um, criminal justice programs uh, through the Department of Justice. So we're so um, grateful that she could be here today. Um, we also have um, uh, Director A.T. Wall from the Department of Corrections in Rhode Island, um, who has been working with us on, on uh, these issues for a really, really long time. And he's the longest standing her longest sitting corrections director in the country. Um, so I stand sitting now, but sitting in, uh, in, in Rhode Island. He's also the president of, um, of ASCA, of all the corrections directors in the country. We also have David DeMora with the Council of State Government's Justice Center here with us today. Um, David handles all of our national uh, initiatives for CSG. I'm very excited that Art Wallenstein from Montgomery County Corrections is also here with us. Again, Art was at the table 10 years ago as we started putting Second Chance together. And last but not least, we also have Pam Rodriguez, for the president of TASC Illinois in Chicago. And she's going to talk to us about a really um, amazing program in, uh, in Illinois, funded by Second Chance Act funds and works with, uh, with moms and their children um, in the Decatur uh, facility. So that's a quick rundown of our speakers, and we're really excited that Congressman Davis may stop by and say hello to us at some point. So we'll take a quick pause when he's able to join us. Uh, but first, I'd like to um, uh, hand it off to Denise. Okay. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. As a former, uh, a former federal prosecutor and United States attorney, I am a strong believer that an investment in reentry is one of the most effective investments our nation can make in public safety. As we know, there are currently over 2.3 million people serving uh, time in our federal and state prisons, millions more circulating through our local jails. Um, and 95% of them come back to our communities. So we, um, as prosecutors, as individuals involved in the criminal justice system, have known for a long time that simply releasing uh, people from prisons and jails um, with a bus token and a new pair of jeans, uh, mostly to homeless shelters, uh, is simply not the way to end a revolving door in our criminal justice system. As recently as five years ago, the concept of reentry and the idea that we could take meaningful steps as a nation to provide services and treatment and mentoring programs, case management, cognitive behavioral programs, job training, transitional employment, reentry courts was for the most part aspirational. 
but we've heard that five years ago the Second Chance Act uh, was really a bold uh, statement uh, that we as a nation can reduce recidivism, crime, and victimization by supporting smart, evidence-based reentry strategies and programs. Since passage of the Second Chance Act, we at the Bureau of Justice Assistance and our partner at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Planning have awarded nearly 500 Second Chance Act grants. You're going to hear about one or two of our um, grants today. Over $250 million, which have provided reentry services to over 24,000 program participants, providing needed services targeted at individuals um, at risk, at high risk of recidivism. I want to highlight just a couple programs in my brief time today. One of the most important contributions of the Second Chance Act is the National Reentry Resource Center, maintained by the Council of State Governments, and you'll hear more about that today. But a national clearinghouse of reentry research, training, and technical assistance and support for state, local, and tribal partners, government agencies, not-for-profits, large and small, urban and rural throughout the country is just a tremendous asset um, for the reentry field. Under a new Second Chance Act program launched last year, BJH challenged state corrections departments to set significant recidivism reduction goals for their systems. What great partners to have in our efforts to reduce recidivism in state Department of Corrections directors like A.T. Well that you'll hear about shortly. We were able to award $6.1 million to seven state departments of corrections last year to actually set goals for recidivism reduction and implement creative, innovative programs using evidence-based practices in order to achieve those goals. We expect to have a similar solicitation out in the next several weeks. Another innovative Second Chance Act program focuses on the, the a critical area historically underfunded in the criminal justice system, namely probation. The Second Chance Act Smart Probation Program provides resources to states, local governments, and tribes to develop evidence-based probation practices that effectively address offenders' needs and reduce recidivism. Last year, BJA made awards to nine community corrections programs, totaling $3.7 million. Notably, the SMAR probation program pairs community corrections departments with criminal justice research partners to evaluate of the programs and develop promising practices and evidence-based practices uh, for the field, another important emphasis of Second Chance Act funding. In fact, the Second Chance Act is the leading source of funding for research into what works in reentry. In partnership with NIJ and DOJ's National Institute of Corrections, BJA is supporting research projects, including randomized controlled trials into reentry demonstration programs, community supervision programs, and reentry courts. Reentry is still a relatively new field. And this investment in research is critical if we are to continue to improve reentry outcomes and create safer communities. In closing, I would be remiss if I did not mention the truly trend-setting role of the Federal Interagency Reentry Council, which since it was first convened uh, by the Attorney General in 2011, has been a model for effective coordination and collaboration for reentry initiatives across federal agencies. Coordinated by OJP's Office of the Assistant Attorney General, there are currently 20 federal agencies participating in the Council's staff level working group. The Reentered Council's Mythbusters, a series of fact sheets designed to clarify existing federal policies that affect formerly incarcerated individuals and their families, um, have really worked hard to remove the barriers um, to reentry. So thank you very much for having us today. The President's budget includes $119 million for Second Chance Act funding, and we hope to have your support. Thank you. Now a little bit of the on-the-ground statewide context. Um, Director A.T. Wall from Rhode Island. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Yes, I am A.T. Wall. I got my start uh, in corrections at the line level 36 years ago and I'm proud to be in my 14th year as director of our Department of Corrections uh, back home in Rhode Island. I can echo what Denise 
O'Donnell said about what reentry used to look like, the, uh, the bus ticket uh, home and virtually nothing else. At, uh, as recently as 15 years ago, I would drive by one of our uh, maximum security institutions on my way to work. It was the time when inmates were being released from sentence. And I would see a dozen of them uh, sitting on this stone wall outside maximum with these dark garbage bags uh, containing all their worldly goods accumulated over the years, looking for all the world like they had no idea what was going to happen next. And I would think to myself, this does not feel good. Those days are changing. And the Second Chance Act has been a very powerful catalyst for altering that picture. Uh, the fact is that uh, using the incentives, uh, the funds, the technical assistance that the Second Chance Act provides, we are making profound uh, changes in providing effective prisoner reentry and reducing recidivism. Our state was one of the fortunate that was selected for a statewide recidivism grant. And I'll give you some sense of what we are doing uh, with, that, uh, with that money and that support. Uh, our goal was to use prisoner reentry uh, and the most effective tools to drive down recidivism rates. Uh, that is to say, to assume responsibility for a lower crime uh, on the part of released offenders. And uh, what we've decided to do, and are in the midst of doing as we speak, is one, to take adv advantage of findings in the most recent uh, research about interventions with criminal offenders. Uh, for example, uh, we're expanding the use of what are called validated risk needs assessments, assessments that will identify uh, which of the people uh, coming into our system and staying in our system uh, are at highest risk of reoffense. We can't be all things to all people. If we really want to make a difference, we need to identify the ones who are most likely to commit crimes once they are released. And we're taking advantage of the research that's been developed in intervening years uh, to target those people so that we're looking at the right people. Uh, we are then uh, designing our in-prison case management system so that it too focuses on those people. There are some folks who come to prison uh, and really don't need extensive interventions. Uh, they, have, uh, they have support on the outside, they have learned their lesson, uh, and they are going to do all right when they're released. We need to focus on the ones for whom we're not so sure that's the case. Uh, quality assurance in programming. It uh, used to be that we tended to take a cafeteria-style approach to programming. You know, here's, here's the buffet table. Uh, come and approach and decide which ones you want. Well, the fact is that uh, some of the people who are least motivated to take those programs are the ones who are most in need of them. So we've organized our case management system and our incentives so that those programs are being uh, targeted for those at highest risk of reoffense. Uh, we're also integrating what's known as cognitive restructuring into our programs. Uh, cognitive restructuring targets criminal thinking, antisocial personalities, the kind of thinking that says, uh, um, she deserved it, or I'm the victim here because I'm the one in prison. That kind of thinking uh, has to be addressed in all of our programs if we're going to make a difference uh, in the long run. Uh, those are some of the things that we're doing in prison. We're also improving linkages with, uh, between our institutional personnel, probation and parole officers, so that the handoff is a smooth and seamless one. And we're equipping our community corrections staff with information about the risk needs assessments so that they can understand where they should target their uh, overwhelmed probation supervision resources, those that are at highest risk. And, of course, we're also partnering with community-based agencies in a big way, including some who have traditionally been our critics in corrections. We have found common ground through the Second Chance Act and, uh, and some of the grants that have gone to those agencies because, at the end of the day, our ability in corrections to provide public safety, uh, while a passionate uh, part of our mission, uh, really does depend on buy-in. That's where our offenders are going to spend most of their time, is in the community. And we need to be supporting those communities in their programs to reintegrate offenders. So uh, finally, uh, for those of you who are wondering uh, how will we know if any of it works, we are making investments in upgrading our computer systems 
so that we can, in fact, track using ongoing performance measures and outcomes and can deliver back to our funders uh, information about, uh, about what is succeeding, uh, what needs more work, and why. So in essence, what you've seen through the Second Chance Act, or what we've seen through the Second Chance Act, and what I'm uh, eager to tell you, is really a great turning of the wheel in our profession, uh, not only in Rhode Island, but, uh, but for all the states. We are finally getting past running safe, secure, orderly constitutional prisons. Those are bedrock, but if we really care to claim our public safety mission, uh, we really need the opportunities provided by the Second Chance Act to take advantage of that time of incarceration and to assure a smooth transition when the rubber meets the road upon release. Thank you very much. One of the key components of Second Chance Act that um, I know the authors and champions are very proud of in crafting the legislation was that it supports both um, states, um, state corrections, as well as county jails and nonprofits that are providing reentry services. So um, we're very glad to have Art Wallenstein from Montgomery County, Maryland, here to share with us their amazing reentry initiatives that they have in, uh, in, in his county. Thank you, and uh, good morning. This issue of the jails most likely needs uh, a short discussion. Historically, there have been prisons and the big houses on one side, and then something uh, that people didn't know much about, local jails. And this opportunity, second chance, really, when it was first drafted, there were some questions of whether jails would be involved, and there was a lot of good work done. The jails are sending between 10 and 13 million people back to local communities. That alone dwarfs, of course, the state prison group, but it opens up an opportunity, all right? It opens up an enormous opportunity to engage the public policy of public safety and an opportunity to keep people from advancing their criminal careers. What I really want to get across to you, my colleagues, this morning is pay attention to the jail side of this issue. Every one of you has multiple jails in your jurisdictions. You have thousands upon thousands of people going home, irrespective of guilt or innocence, almost all of them with criminal histories. And it has never been a better time to engage collaboration at the local level as it relates to offenders coming home than it has been over the last couple of years. To me, it's the excitement in this profession all right, AT's been in Rhode Island for a long time. I've been the director in Montgomery County for 13 years, and I've been a director in county corrections for 36 years. So I've seen a lot of things come and go. But without question, reentry is the most exciting concept to engage the profession of corrections, most likely in the last generation. We run a full reentry program, all right? We run it inside of our jail. We also run it at our community-based work release uh, reentry center. It's a state of mind. You do it. It takes a change. As A.T. really mentioned very artfully, I think, uh, life and safety obviously are major components. They're irrevocable and they're non-debatable. But reentry should be there too. All right? Community is as valid a concept as custody, care, and control. And second chance and other programs, certainly through labor and education, have had an impact. But never has the debate and the interest in this area been so significant. And much of the credit certainly must go to not just the legislation of Second Chance, all right, the grants and the discussion, but the aura of public policy discussion that's going on all over the country. And it needn't run smack into Get Tough. The two concepts really, in many respects, have nothing to do with each other. We hear this comment, you can't put John Jones out on work release, he's dangerous. Good, so we'll do nothing, and in 90 days he'll go home with no preparation, all right, and no support, and no linkage to the community. Montgomery County Corrections is located about 20 miles up the road, and I'll leave some cards here, and we would welcome anyone who would like to visit and see what this means in terms of actual operations, not just philosophical discussion. We do workforce development training. 
We have a linkage program with Montgomery College where they come in and do a digital education for all 750 people who go through our work release program every year. All right, we're building collaborative relationships with scores of organizations. Of course, the faith community has been a prime supporter, and of course, they were around when no one else gave an interest or a hoot about some of this stuff, and they are to be commended. In closing, programs do work. We finally taught ourselves after 25 years that drug treatment works, all right? Treatment works, not in every case, of course. But we can engage people in a positive manner, and you don't need 10 years to do it. We believe we can engage with 10 days left to go. Why? Because they're going home, and if we can do some positive program development and linkage to the community, we can have a positive impact. Jails count. Counties count. Please pay attention not only to reentry, not only to prisons, but to the jail, probation, and community correction side of this equation. Thank you. There are um, a number of programs created under Second Chance. Um, you've heard about the state recidivism program where Rhode Island is a recipient of. Uh, Denise has given a breakdown of so the probation program. Um, uh, Montgomery County has received support um, through both, the, I believe, the uh, job training program through Second Chance as well as a demonstration project. Um, so you're getting a sampling of the work that is being advanced um, uh, and seeded throughout the country. Uh, another um, uh, program within Second Chance that uh, is near and dear to many of our hearts is the family-based drug treatment program that Second Chance created. Um, and we have Pam Rodriguez, who's president of TASC Illinois, um, who's involved in that, that program here to share um, an update on um, the women that they've served, the families that they've served, and it's, it's a very uplifting story. So, Pam. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and thank you all for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about one of the things that um, TASC has been doing with regards to reentry. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, I run an organization in the state of Illinois that is statewide. We've been around since 1976, focusing on issues of criminal justice, addiction, um, the courts, corrections, probation, parole. And so there's, we've had a lot of opportunity to see some things come and go. And Second Chance is really important to, I think, changing the conversation, as you've heard people talk about today. Um, and I really encourage you all to um, uh, take the lessons you're learning today and, and go forward with a support for Second Chance. Let me tell you a little bit about Moms and Babies. The um, Moms and Babies program is a nursery uh, prison-based program in Decatur, Illinois, which is sort of in the central part of the state, a rural area. And um, they have uh, developed a nursery there for pregnant women going into prison, where the women can keep their children with them, their babies with them. Uh, the latest numbers I, that I've seen are that about 6% of women entering prison are pregnant. And the majority of those women lose their children once they deliver them. This is a program that enables moms to keep their babies with them. The, um, they, have to be, they, they have to, in order to participate, they can't have uh, violent history or violent charges. They can't have had involvement with our Department of Children and Family Services, so they, they can't have um, some history of abuse and neglect, for example. Uh, but many of, and, and many of them um, have other children at home as well. So if, and just to give you a scope of the problem nationally, about 6% of women entering prison are pregnant at the time that they enter, and that's, there are over 100,000 women a year who go into prison, so that's about 6,000 women um, delivering babies while they're in prison. This program is a small program. It's, the nursery was developed in 2007. The Second Chance Funding is a partnership between the Illinois Department of Corrections and TASC. We got that money in 2012 to really enhance not just the nursery um, component, but the reentry component of this program. And so we have um, the women, while they're in prison, get um, all kinds of parenting classes, nutritional classes, um, bonding support. It looks like a nursery. You do not feel like you're in a prison. Um, the, the women 
get to keep their children with them all the time, except when they're in groups. And then there are babysitters, there are volunteer babysitters, et cetera. Um, about 50, no, not about, 50 women have completed the program. They're in there for around two years. So around 50 women have completed, and one has recidivated. 2% recidivism rate. Um, they go back to community, they raise their other children, they are engaged, they're getting treatment support and reentry support. It doesn't matter where they go in the state, we follow them and ensure that they have wraparound services and support in order to continue to um, bond with their children, in order to continue to raise their children, to remain drug free, and it's working. So this is a, a small example of what can be done with Second Chance Funding. The, the challenge, I think, for all of us is to take what we're learning in these, in these environments and bring them to scale. Imagine what we could do if all 6,000 women who entered prison pregnant were able to keep their children, bond with them, and we had a 2% recidivism rate. It would be phenomenal. The impact on communities, the impact on families, um, and it's, it, I have to tell you, it's all, there's also a huge impact on my staff. Um, the staff are, are so um, invigorated and so connected and so rewarded by this work. It's a, it's a really unique little niche um, service program but it has a huge impact on what's happening to uh, the women and their children and their families as they return home. So thank you, thank you Justice, thank you Jessica, thank you Congressman Davis and uh, Senator Portman for supporting and um, developing the Second Chance Act. As Denise mentioned, um, outside of grant support and resources for states, counties, and nonprofits, um, another uh, key feature of Second Chance, um, which was in from the very beginning, 10 years ago while we were sort of hammering this out, um, is the National Reentry Resource Center. And today we have David DeMora with us from CSG, um, who's involved in the Resource Center, and, and again, um, advancing the field, developing knowledge, and improving reentry nationwide. He's going to give us a quick breakdown of what we've learned and what the Resource Center is engaged in. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, some of you are in the front row, maybe looking at the sign and wondering if I have an alias, uh, or <laughs> some of you are in the back row. Dr. Skinner, who is the head of our National Reentry Resource Center, went to the Midwest last week and unfortunately became ill and so was unable to come today. So I am uh, pinch hitting for our very able Dr. Skinner. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what some of the data tells us. If you would uh, go to the next slide. But what some of the data tells us and what some of the research tells us. You've heard Director Wall and Director Wallenstein talk about how they have been doing this on the ground. And part of the question then becomes is, well, how do these decisions get made? Well, first of all, as the Reentry Council has shown in terms of their study of the issue, reentry is, of course, a public safety issue, but it's not only a public safety issue. It's an employment issue. Two of three of the men who become incarcerated were working prior to incarceration. As a result of incarceration, obviously, they stop working, and often it is very difficult for them to get employment upon release. It is a public health issue. Very many of the individuals who end up being incarcerated uh, end up carrying communicable diseases. It is a housing issue. Homelessness is clearly associated with a higher risk of incarceration. And it's an education issue. Of the 20 fastest growing uh, occupations right now in the United States, 13 of them require post-secondary education. Yet very few folks who are incarcerated have the appropriate education to be able to make it upon return. So what does the research say reduces recidivism? Well, again, you heard how it's being enacted, but we actually do have the data to support these issues, first focusing on individuals most likely to reoffend. It doesn't mean that we ignore the other folks. It means that we want to put the highest degree of our uh, intervention for those folks who are most likely to commit a new offense. Programs do need to be based on research, on data, on science, and there needs to be a quality assurance component to them. The days of just doing what feels right is past. We need to implement effective community supervision policies and practices, and we have data to show that certain types of probation and supervision practices, practices or parole practices are much more effective than others. We need to apply place-based strategies. 
While the principles of what we do will be the same in Rhode Island, in Maryland, in Iowa, in New York, in Washington, how we actually do that, how we operationalize it changes depending on each locale. And the programming as well needs to be tailored. For example, some of you learn very well by listening and so the first speakers, that was great. Some of you learn better by looking and so you're glad there's some slides right now. And some of you learn experientially and you're having a bad hour because <laughs> you're not doing anything about that. Uh, well, if it's true for us, and we all are motivated to be here, you can imagine what that's like if you're not. Next slide, please. In terms of programming, what about the programming? Well, it needs to be tailored correctly. It needs to be the right programming. The data tells us that cognitive behavioral interventions, a certain type of intervention, are the most effective, and that they should be curricula-based, meaning there's a manual, not just a sit down and tell me how you feel kind of conversation. It needs to be delivered in the right manner, what's called fidelity. It needs to be done in the right sequence. Not everybody needs the same thing at the same time in the same way. A simple example is if somebody has a significant mental illness, they need to be stabilized before the cognitive interventions can be effective. You try to do that with somebody with that severe mental illness, they will fail, and often we will not look at the fact that we didn't do the right sequencing, we'll just say the person was not motivated when that wasn't the issue. Therefore, it needs to be provided by the right people who are trained, coached, certified, for the right people, again, the issue of folks who are moderate or high risk of recidivism, at the right time, and you heard again, starting pre-release, even if it's only 10 days, and moving into the community, and in the right dosage. And, and actually, that dosage uh, changes dramatically, but if we average it out, you're looking at about two to four days a week for a short period of time. Not days, two to four times a week, I should say, for a short period of time. What's that period of time? Somewhere between three and six months. So comprehensive responses, according to the research, involve a number of things. One, responding to the criminogenic risk, the things most likely to directly cause recidivism. But effective responses are greater than that. There needs to be a focus on overall wellness and holistic services, factors to increase long-term success, the health care issues that we all know are such a major issue. The first slide that I showed you in terms of communicable diseases, in terms of mental health, behavioral health, substance abuse, as you heard from one of our speakers, education clearly shown to have an impact in terms of lowering recidivism, housing, and vocational training and employment. So how do we do that? How do we uh, tailor those comprehensive services? Well, those that have been associated with positive outcomes include cognitive interventions that specifically promote pro-social attitudes and values, not just any type of cognitive behavioral intervention, but those that really move the person's thinking from, it's okay to get what I want and forget everybody else, to I'm part of a larger society and I have a role to play here in terms as a valued citizen, as a productive citizen. Intensive drug and alcohol treatment when necessary, particularly when it is paired with community aftercare. Again, education programs, vocational education and skills-oriented training with appropriate job matching. And so it's not just the issue of teaching people how to do a job, it's teaching different types of folks how to do the right job. You're all very good at your job because of who you are. Other people would be very bad at your job because it's not how they work, it's not what they do. The same is true for those individuals who have been incarcerated. And finally, in terms of the National Reentry Resource Center, our job, among other things, uh, is to provide technical assistance to grantees, but it's also to be able to work with experts around the country to gather the data, to gather the research, and to be able to put it out in formats that are helpful to folks in the community. To that end, there's, we have developed many publications, just one of which is shown up here, a 10-step guide to effective probation. We do routine webinars uh, practically every other week, in fact, we have, and we store them on our website, so you can go to the justicecenter.org website and you can find webinars on a variety of reentry topics going back for several years. We are developing or have developed what's called the What Works in Reentry Clearinghouse, and this is also live, and what it basically is is a summary of the research that talks about what works in reentry. And we have several parts of that up live already, and over the next few months we will be populating other sections so that ultimately by topic, employment, housing, mental health, substance abuse, you'll be able to go to each of those topics and look at what does work in those areas that help improve outcomes for reentry, lower recidivism, and include positive outcomes. And finally, 
we have a number of uh, frequently asked questions documents also up on the website. It is our great honor and privilege that we have been fortunate to provide these services, that the SCA Act has really allowed us to do this, that the Bureau of Justice Assistance has been such a tremendous partner along with the other federal partners in helping us to do this work. And we are very thrilled that we have been able to do this, and we are very thrilled that we will be continuing to do this uh, for the foreseeable future, at least. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Um, we wanted to allow some time for some question and answers, but before we start that, I also wanted to see if Matt from NACO could share a few words. Again, CSG and NACO have partnered on this for a long time, so we're so glad that they could do this event with us today. Well, great. Well, thank you, Jessica. It is an honor to co-sponsor this event. I'm with the National Association of Counties. We are pleased to co-sponsor the Council of State Government. I think Art, not only works for the county, but he's part of the faith-based community. As you listen to him, he's really passionate about this. And we have over 3,000 counties across the country that work on this. We have over 2,600 jails. And for us, this issue, the Second Ch Chance Act, and we it's not just about economics, it's also about social, community, and moral issues. So when we start talking about 13 million entries each year and re-entries, that's a whole lot of folks, including their families. For counties, we spend over $70 billion a year on public safety and criminal justice. And we spend over $70 million separately on health and human services. And some of the folks in these jails are the exact same people using our law enforcement services and our social services. So this is a big issue for us. We want to continue to partner with Senator Portman, Congressman Davis, and all, all of you to advance the Second Chance Act. I just want to thank you again. Great. So I think we have a bit of time for questions and answers for panelists. In answer to your first question, we are, in fact, uh, the NRC is, in fact, in the midst of embarking on a juvenile project. In fact, tomorrow we have a major meeting with the key advisors from around the country to talk about that. In, in response to your second question, uh, there are lessons we have learned at the adult level that can be translated, but there are substantive differences, and juvenile offenders are not mini-me adult offenders. And so we can't simply take everything we've learned at the adult level and translate that over. The principles are still true. Risk assessment's important. The right programming is important. Lowering recidivism is important. Uh, targeting the right people are important. But within those areas, what you do and how you do it is significantly different for juveniles than for adults. And the other thing to note is that Second Chance does support adult as well as juvenile reentry. So there are parallel tracks that are provided for adult corrections and into juvenile corrections through a number of the programs under Second Chance. And if um, uh, we can share info, we can send that out to you all if you're interested in some of the best practices or models that have emerged on both the adult and juvenile side. Other questions? Right here. Uh, good morning. Excellent presentation. My name is Carl Chad Van. I'm from uh, Charleston, West Virginia. We're a Second Chance Act grantee, as well as an OFA Responsible Fatherhood Incarceration uh, Corrections grantee. Uh, first part of the question: um, Given that we know the what the research says about risk need assessment and separating high risk, moderate, and low in the regional jails, in particular, and also in the, uh, the prisons, how have you handled the space, the limited space that most facilities have? Separate, and then trying to separate high risk to low risk. And then the second part, how much uh, state buy-in have you had when you hear the, you know, the new terms, kind of justice reinvestment and projected savings that states will have if they follow the policy recommendations and the actual real upfront money that is needed in order to get that investment started? Let me respond uh, briefly. You presented that question very, very well. All right, this issue of space, we certainly haven't minded constructing prisons all over this landscape, all right? 
and are now in states like New York and other places trying to figure out what to do with, with some of that expenditure. The question is, well, we don't want, quote, those kinds of programs in our jurisdiction. And I think you have to butt heads philosophically. You have to bring the faith community into this. How can you be butting heads when they're all going home anyway? And, and we don't have to discuss all of that right now, but I find that's a fairly effective argument. In Montgomery County, we have a, a community correction center. We've been there longer than all the surrounding businesses, and we're right in the middle of the largest commercial district in, in Montgomery County. But we're still always pushing. And of course, in the prisons, you can build program because the community rarely objects to things they can't see, all right? Uh, but nonetheless, good program can be done, all right? My issue is this, coalition building and collaboration. The junior colleges and community colleges have an enormous role to play, and the Department of Education is starting to engage that whole issue now. Department of Labor is starting to really engage, and depending on outcomes of nomination processes and what have you, there may be some enormous advocates moving in that direction. I believe that community advocates have to go to elected officials at the local level and simply say, folks, what are you doing about reentry? Because at the local level, you don't have to travel 500 miles to get to there, and you will meet these people at home. Push like blazes, because it's mainstream now. It's not something out on the fringe. Obviously, you've done that in your jurisdiction. And why shouldn't there be a community corrections facility in every single county in the United States? I can't figure it out. They're much cheaper to build than prisons, and the same people are going home. I'm really quite fascinated uh, with the degree of work that's being done, particularly in terms of assessment. And uh, the concept of assessment validation, cognitive restructuring, somebody's missing. What I'm concerned about is um, uh, the concept of assessment validation, who's most likely to commit a crime. They're valid. But if I take a look at the prison um, pipeline for schools, there's research now validating that young men in the third and fourth grade are likely to have in the criminal justice system by the time they're 20. That's, I'm really concerned about that kind of assessment validation. And so uh, I know we've had uh, times when we thought we had the right research, such as with crack and cocaine, and we found out that that was somewhat flawed, that is equally addictive. But we imprisoned a lot of people based on that false research. So I'm really concerned that as we look at research as a tool, we have some protection from being so absorbed by it that we end up trying to do our very best but making deadly mistakes and incarcerating people for long periods of time only to find out that we could have done better. So what, what is happening to, a, a, to monitor very carefully uh, some of these possibilities and, and the possibility of cognitive restructuring. I'd like to know, is cognitive restructuring also going on with systems? Because these people are released to systems. Uh, is cognitive restructuring going on in terms of making housing, public housing available, giving people the ability to uh, have a driver's license, being able to vote? I we need real cognitive restructuring in terms of these systems areas. So I'm trying to understand, it seems like it's marvelously uh, devoted to working with the individual, but unless there's some systemic cognitive restructuring, we're going to still have a problem moving ahead with creation. Well, you raised a lot of good points. So um, the prison to school pipeline is an area that our Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Planning is really focusing on and has some exciting new projects going on in that area that uh, we'd be happy to talk to you about. Um, but the, um, the, risk, the use of risk needs assessment tools um, is something that we are looking at extremely carefully. First of all, they're not looked at to predict who's going to prison in the future. But they are an effective tool to look at who needs the services the most. 
and to channel the resources to the high-risk populations where the research has shown they're more effective. And we also know from the research that we can make low-risk people worse, and that's something that we've seen time and time again. So it's an important tool so we can make sure that we are not increasing recidivism by the kinds of treatment that we're providing. So you make good points, but it's something that we're looking at very, very carefully of how to use risk needs assessment tools. They also change um, and have to be um, changing documents. That's why we look at the needs component and the programming that individuals have. Finally, on the restructuring issue, um, there was mention of the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, and that's something we did a briefing on briefly and can't really go into today. But part of our work in that area is to look at system realignment um, across our country to look for the reasons that you stated. Mind you, I'm an IT person, so I do have a question in reference to that. I also have a question based on what you have presented. And let me start with that first. Right? You said uh, there's a wraparound service for the women that, that go. There's a wraparound service for the women that, that go uh, leave the system. Um, how long do you, do you follow them? Is there a point that is a handle? to uh, community uh, faith-based uh, organization or some other organization. Um, and then is there some follow-up on maybe your organization to find out how well that person is doing or did they actually repeat before you find out from the system? You understand what I'm saying? You know, kind of, because you know the, the, the citizenship rate is, is increasing. Mm -hmm. So you know, my, my thought is, Having more efforts to prevent it from, from you know, returning citizens to go back in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's the one question. The other question is about um, systems that are put in place, IT systems, information systems that are put in place, so that if let's just say I was a, a criminal in Maryland and I went to Florida, how is that being tracked? You know, from state to state. And I know it's, a, it's probably an enormous uh, a task to put it all together as each state works differently, but um, we know that this, this society is, is transient. We move you know, often now. So we may be you know, following a, a circle and can't catch up with it and have no idea that that day is important from one state to another. So Pam, did you want to start? And then I want to come back and talk a little bit about recidivism rate and some newest findings. Sure. Um, we, uh, the, the wraparound services that we help to provide are not only provided by us. So our goal is to really get people stabilized and connected in communities. And that includes um, uh, their family and, and moving back home or moving into a nice, uh, safe place for them to live. It, mo it includes participation in recovery support groups, whether it's AA, NA, or other kinds of things. It includes um, connecting to faith-based programs, to mentors, all kinds of things. So when I say we do wraparound, we just ensure that all of those supports are there for folks with the idea that then that becomes their natural support ongoing, okay? And, and we stay involved with people around 18 months post-release. So. It's, it's a good length of time. Um, we get less involved over time with the idea that more of our support transitions to community and family, uh, and that um, seems to be really effective and, and working well. The other thing that is always available is that the women can call us back anytime they need to, to just get a little support, a little um, information. Sometimes they, don't, they, wanna go, they need some kind of help they don't know how to find. And so even if we've disengaged from them, that's always there as a resource for them. Do you have, have you tracked any, or sometime, have you tracked any of those partners uh, reporting back to you um, what they have discovered that, I mean, maybe, maybe it's just an update, let's just put it that way, on that particular uh, <coughs> citizen return. Sure. Yeah, has there been any, any well, what we do is kind of as a team, so we're just sort of in contact with and communication with folks um, on a... Well, beyond 18 months is what I'm talking about. Oh, no. I, we, we, don't, we, we have not followed people beyond 18 months, but that, 
and so I wanted to address your issue about how we handle um, technical violations. And so when I, the, um, recidiv the one woman who went, uh, who recidivated is back in prison. Um, the other, I'm not saying that they've never had problems while they're out, right? And perhaps in other situations, they might have been technically violated for curfew or a positive drug test or something like that. But instead of violating them and bringing them back to prison, the support and the interventions that we provide keep people in community and stabilized there. Um, rap, and parole is involved, so it's not like this is something that we're doing you know, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, we do it together, but we don't violate them unless there's a serious new offense that has to be addressed. And also, going back to the question about recidivism rates, um, I was on, on here on this side um, 10 years plus ago when we started talking about second chance and reentry and addressing this, and it was very alarming to hear 67% recidivism rate, rearrest within three years, and we all sort of felt very compelled to do something, and second chance was a bipartisan response to that. Um, what we know um, now, and just a report that came out several months ago, is uh, states are reducing recidivism statewide um, in, in very significant ways. Um, CSG released a report in, I think it was September of last year, um, so not too, not too long ago. Um, Double-digit reductions in recidivism, not just one small program, not one facility, but the entire state of Texas has reduced its recidivism rate by 11%, not over time, not over 20 years, but just in the last couple years. Um, Ohio is also down 11% to reach its all-time low for re recidivism rate since they've been tracking recidivism. It's at 28%. Um, and Michigan um, rings in, and we have uh, sort of former reentry director for Michigan here, Leanne Duran. Um, but Michigan um, has an 18% reduction in recidivism o only over the last couple years. So these are recent reductions that are statewide affecting entire systems. Um, all of these um, uh, states are receiving support from Second Chance, from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, from other programs, from the Resource Center, that they're implementing evidence-based practice and they're doing it in the right way and using research. So it's not just, we can't say it's just because of Second Chance, but we can say this is an important tool that is turning the tide on recidivism and improving prisoner reentry. And so there's great news that we can share. And um, a great way to sort of close this up, we have <laughs> Congressman Davis here that we would uh, love to hear, hear from him for a few minutes um, uh, so we can close our, our briefing today. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, it won't take long. Let me first of all thank all of you for being here. Let me thank all of those who are facilitating the interaction and making sure that we are conveying the information. Unfortunately, we have a number of things going on, of course, as we usually do at the same time. I've got a vote coming up in Ways and Means that I gotta run back to and vote because we've been doing a markup on the debt ceiling and the debt limits and what we're going to spend and what we're not going to spend and what we're going to pay and what we're not going to pay. But it's so good to see us engaged in this discussion. Reentry is becoming more and more of an understandable issue. That is, more and more people are beginning to understand the impact of it and what it actually means. And the fact that there are millions of individuals in our country whose lives are put on hold whose lives are devastated, who can't imagine that they can ever pursue or continue to pursue the American dream as long as they're boxed out, as long as they're marginalized. I talked to a person the other day who had just gotten his record uh, pardon. He'd gotten a pardon from the governor. When he was a kid, he happened to be driving a car and had a gun. One of the most delightful individuals that I know has a wife, child, works, house, has his own business. He called me and he was so ecstatic. I mean, he just, he, he, he couldn't contain himself. No one, it was as if something had been lifted from him and he was now prepared to go on with his life. 
So I really thank all of you and appreciate the work that you have done. I greatly, and I always do this, a lady named Jessica Nichols, <laughs> who's been working for years and years and years, that I first met, she was a staffer for Senator Rob Portman. And she, along with others, have helped move this to the point it's been a bipartisan. I mean, I hate to single her out like that, but I do. But there are <laughs> other people who, who've done the same thing. Helen Mitchell, who works for me, same thing. Laser focused. So I just thank all of you. I'm so excited. Pam, it's so good to see you. To see the numbers of people, Dennis, it's a pleasure. We've just got to keep working, got to keep it in front of people and help people to know that it's not really just about people who are called ex-offenders, but it's about America. It's about all of us, and to the extent that they become productive citizens, that's the extent to which our country continues to grow, develop, and flourish. So I thank you very much. And please carry on and continue. Thank you, Congressman Davis. Um, I, I, I truly believe that uh, this issue would not be where it is. We wouldn't be able to report back to you on this much progress if it weren't for Congressman Danny Davis and Senator Rob Portman. I know Megan has joined us from Senator Portman's office in the back row, so you can wave and say hello to everyone. So um, I think we, we've used our, a lot of time for questions and answers. Um, if we can follow up with any more materials on Second Chance or the grant programs or resources um, or research, please let us know. Um, we'd be happy to do that. I'd also like to thank Jeff Burdett and Jay Nelson and Warren Hansen for helping us from CSG set up the event today. And uh, thank you so much.